Okay. Hi, everybody. Good. We've got the wave down. Excellent. Since this is my one opportunity to really to directly talk to you about the science, I did want to say a little bit more about um, you know sort of the way that neuroscientists are now conceptualizing what mindfulness training is and its utility for high stress, high performance groups. And I would consider law students among those individuals, especially at this particular moment when we're trying to keep our heads together and keep everything going and, and make sure our academic investment is, is steady, even though a lot is unsteady in our lives. Um, and as Scott may have mentioned to you, you know, he and I have been working over the last decade together on exactly sort of that kind of group. Obviously, undergraduates, as uh, the paper, one of the papers that you read describes, but also people that are in their professional lives face a lot of stress, including lawyers and judges, uh, but also military service members, military spouses, first responders, medical professionals, uh, the list sort of goes on and on. So the, the work that I'll share with you today is going to take, I want to tell you a little bit about me and the work that we do in my lab, because we're I know not, none of us are on campus, but just so you know, when we are all back, hopefully that will happen. Um, my lab is very close to the law school and we do conduct brain imaging studies on mindfulness. So just know that what I'm telling you today isn't sort of just written in the past, but it's actively happening now. Actually, I don't know if I told you, Scott, but we're in the process of getting a new scanner. So even though really nobody's on campus, um, one of the people in my lab was in the building yesterday picking up something and pieces of the scanner were <laughs> everywhere as we're, we're, getting, we're getting upgraded to an, a new, more powerful uh, scanner. Okay, so I'll just start off by telling you guys a little bit more about uh, uh, work in my lab. You know, frankly, this, this, this slides are just an aid to just get through the discussion. We don't really need to see them. Um, so just to back up, so in my laboratory, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, which means that the work in my lab is interested in understanding how the mind is instantiated within the hardware of the brain, so to speak, and in particular, how it is that this important brain function of attention actually is taking place. Like, what, is its, what are its functional properties? So we use a variety of different um, techniques, like functional MRIs, I mentioned. It's just kind of like a, um, well, it's like a scanner you might go into to get your knee or your back scanned, you know, to make sure it's healthy. But we have specific software that allows us to track brain function by tracking blood flow in the brain. And so we use functional MRI, we use uh, electrical recordings, EEG, and behavioral tasks to tap into how attention works. And after doing this, you know, since my graduate school days, which are long, long ago, um, and then, of course, being a professor, what we realized is that, as you all know, attention is incredibly powerful, extremely powerful. It determines it's needed for every single thing we're doing, including your ability to hear my words and comprehend what they mean, right? But at the same time, as if, if you've had a chance to watch the TED Talk, I talk about this, what we know is that even though it's powerful, it's also vulnerable. And there are kind of three top forms of um, kryptonite, if you will, or really disablers of attention, which are stress, poor mood, and threat. And, <laughs> If we could live a life without having those, that would be great, but we can't, you know, especially like if you think about this current moment, none of us wanted to experience any of the stress, poor mood or threat that comes with this. Scott, slides are capable? Okay, um, but just to finish the sentence, but here we are, right? So even though we need to be able to use our attention for everything we do, we happen to experience circumstances that are disabling of attention. And from that, what I started getting very interested in, in, in is, um, what routes we might have to train attention to make it stronger, more capable, more resilient, because these are just part of the human condition. And not only they're part of part and parcel of just normal everyday life, but for some professions, including the profession that you all are pursuing, it's sort of characteristic of what it means to be in your professional context. You are probably going to be called upon in moments where you or other people are going to be experiencing stress, poor mood, and threat. Um, whether that's, you know, obviously in the case of soldiers, it may be physical threat. Uh, in the case of the people that you would be encountering or you yourself might experience, it's obvi obviously the sense of psychological threat or psychological safety that we, we see. And the brain does not care if it's physical or psychological. It responds sort of the same way. So mindfulness training became a powerful tool that we started pursuing as a cognitive training tool. 
And what I want to share with you today is really how it is that we can think about mindfulness as a cognitive training tool and what it is within the series of practices, including the open monitoring practice that you guys are focusing on this week, that strengthen it, that train it, that is sort of the, and some, as some of our military colleagues say, the push up for the mind uh, that we might do repeatedly to actually strengthen up these core capacities. All right, so this next slide is what I just described to you, sort of our basic program of research. And um, the next one is actually just describing all the people in my lab that I get to uh, you know, share their brilliant work. I'm the only one speaking, but of course there's lots of people, including our wonderful instructor for this course, Scott, who has been an invaluable collaborator all these years and has allowed us to do the work that we do. Um, you'll also see some of the kinds of groups that we work with in this image, right? The um, uh, service members, uh, firefighters, football players, a whole host of uh, professional sports teams. And of course, we don't have a lot of pictures of here, but many people in the legal profession we work with as well. Okay, so what kind of categorizes or captures the kind of groups that we work with? This is just a listing of some of the groups, students, athletes, firefighters, military personnel, um, but all of them have some things in common, and as I've already described, right? That they are prone to, uh, we're all prone to the kind of ups and downs of life, but for these particular groups, meaning all of us, since we're all in an academic context, there are intervals over which stress is not simply um, ups and downs, but kind of incessant and, and protracted, and it almost, you could say, ramps up as we go over the course of the academic semester, for example. Um, so actually, it's funny. My husband is, uh, went to law school, and I was you know, his girlfriend at the time, so I remember these days. And I remember at the point where he actually was preparing to take the bar exam, that it was, he was so single-focused that it was almost like nothing else. Everything kind of cleared away from his mind. Um, and the uh, ability for him to do m much of anything else was, I was seeing it being reduced. I was actually in graduate school studying attention at the time, so it's kind of an interesting primer for what ended up being sort of the rest of my career um, of how this uh, demand, how attentional demands can actually constrain and sometimes disable our attention. So, but all of these groups that I've listed here have these high stress intervals, whether it's athletes and you know, the preseason training or firefighters and hurricane season, military service members and pre-deployment or deployment itself. Um, and what kind of captures this is this notion that what we wanna be able to do over these high stress intervals is still optimize our performance. We still need to be able to perform well and we need to be resilient to whatever challenges we may experience. And not only do we need to get through the whole thing, we need to be successful through it. We need to keep our ability to perform well kind of steady throughout, no matter what uh, demands are coming at us kind of piecemeal, but also as they may increase over the course of, let's say, an academic semester. So there's high demand and high stress circumstances. And because all of this is happening, we end up being extremely time pressured. We don't have a lot of extra leeway to try to explore new things, et cetera. So even if, for example, you decide that, you know, I'm so stressed right now, it'd be so great if I could go on a one month mindfulness retreat, yeah, good luck with that, right? <laughs> That's not gonna happen. In fact, finding 15 minutes in a day where you might be able to practice things that you know may be beneficial are not always available to us. So that's just to say, this is the nature of the kind of groups that we work with and that I wanna share with you today uh, in terms of the research. So here's what I would like to share, um, and it's gonna be fast. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably skip slides, I'll go over stuff, I'll, I'll um, kind of condense across multiple slides, but not to worry, it's, it's essentially captured in, in this overall roadmap and the next slide that'll give you sort of the take home messages. So we'll talk about what mindfulness training is, and I know you're all familiar with it already, but really the way I'll talk about it is that how it's related to this notion of training the mind, training the brain, and strengthening attention. And we'll talk about why it's useful, which I think you all already kind of get the sense of this uh, through your pursuit over this semester on the topic. I wanna kind of back up um, from that to just ask a, a more general question is, does it work? Meaning, if we put our effort into training ourselves and training our minds, what's the evidence to date that this is an effective use of our time? And it's a very brass tacks kind of question, you know, does it matter? Um, and I will try to give you a sense of, at least in this moment, why we do think it matters and why we think it matters even for people that have very little time because it provides such key strengthening of uh, these capacities that become vulnerable over stress. And then 
we have been pursuing, Scott and I and the work in my lab has been, has been pursuing best practices. So if you're gonna do it, what is the most time efficient, accessible, scalable way in which you can get the core workout, so to speak, and get benefits from the training? And I do wanna share some of that with you because I think that um, it's not, it, then it becomes not just a great idea and if I have time, sometime in my life, I'll do it. But like, look, this is the minimum effective dose that if I do every day, I will see benefits in my own life. And it gets you much more in the driver's seat of what may be possible for you in these high demand moments, high demand intervals, frankly. So the take home message will just be um, uh, where we'll, where we'll uh, end up at the end of this talk. And I always like to give this slide because <laughs> One thing I know as an attention researcher, and again, if you saw the TED talk, you see me emphasize this, half of our waking moments, our attention is not in our present moment. So you're all sitting here, I see you, some you know faces I can see are looking attentive at me, but I know your minds are gonna be all over the place. Um, just that's the natural nature of the mind. So if you're not here half the time, I wanna make sure that we don't end up with you only getting 15 minutes worth of information. So here's where we're going. Try to stay with me, stop, try to stay, attentive. Um, and here's what I'm going to tell you, that high stress circumstances compromise well-being, attention, and associated cognitive functions. So these are things that need attention to be able to work well. Situational awareness, what's happening right now? Can I read the room? What are the current demands that are required? Decision-making, planning, problem-solving. Um, and that resilience is trainable. It's not just a great idea or a capacity you happen to have or not have but it's something you can actually pursue as, as bettering in yourself uh, to make it more accessible. And that science, while encouraging, we have a long way to go, uh, but I, I'm gonna give you some highlights that, that might help motivate your ongoing engagement in, in mindfulness practice. All right, so let's start with this kind of image. Um, you know, and this is just to kind of paint the picture from an historical journey of where we're at right now. So a hundred years ago, if somebody said, um, it's a good idea to get on your bicycle, uh, just take off the back wheel and uh, pedal as hard and fast as you can for 30 minutes to go nowhere. Most people would say, you're nuts. You know, if you saw people running 100 years ago, usually you'd think they're getting chased by a you know, fire or a bear. This is not something we, we pursue. But of course, we do this all the time. Maybe we're doing less of it because all the gyms are closed right now. But we do this because we know that physical exercise is good for phys physical health. And just raise your hand if you uh, agree with me that, you know, with this set, with this question, right? Does physical exercise improve physical health? Raise your hand. That's everybody, right? Every single person is raising their hand right now. In fact, you'd say, this is so obvious. Why, why are you even wasting our time talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this because this is a new, relatively new cultural understanding. And the reason we are able to have this cultural understanding is because of science. And um, uh, you know, we now know exactly what we're supposed to do. The CDC, the, the Surgeon General, these are um, organizations that can tell us precisely what we should do to stay physically fit. We don't always do it, but we know what we should do. And there's about 300,000 research articles that have been published since 1980 that parse out this relationship that have led us to this cultural understanding. We now know science has confirmed as much as science ever can that this relationship is real. And so the reason I wanna bring this up is because, you know, if we ask a related question, you know, does mental exercise improve our psychological well-being? I mean, how many of you would say yes to this? Yeah, probably you're all gonna say yes, you're in this class, you've been hearing about this. You're a biased sample, as we might say. But if we went through and I asked each of you, you know, tell me exactly the kind of exercise you think is gonna help psychological well-being, We'd have a variety of answers. You know, some might have things that they like to do and, and others might have other things. And of course, we're nowhere near being able to say with certainty and authority from our public health officials exactly what that looks like. And, and that's just because the science hasn't quite caught up yet. So just to say we all kind of are, are triangulating around this, but part of the work in my lab is trying to get us to the same point. We are with physical activity and physical health. What is the repertoire of things? What are the suite of things we might do every day to keep ourselves psychologically healthy and resilient. All right, does that make sense of kind of what, what the parallel is? Just not if you're getting me, if you're with me. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so um, 
I'm not the only one that's interested in this. The NIH itself has been asking people, what do you do to help your psychological well-being? And this is even a dated by, dated by a few years, but meditation is a very common response that people give with regard to what they do for mind-body practices. And, and I wanna just say one word regarding meditation because I, I don't know if you've actually used that term, probably you've heard mindfulness meditation in the conversations, but from again, a brain training perspective, the way that I think about meditation is sort of the same way I might think of another umbrella term. That's why I literally put an umbrella in here to remind me to tell you that. A broad category that kind of anchors around kind of a family resem resemblance approach to what we made mean in the same way the term sports means something right but what you do specifically to train to be an olympia olympic level golfer very different than what you do to be a gymnast so it's an anchoring kind of broad umbrella term but there's specificity same thing goes with meditation meditation i would say is in the mental realm right mental training exercises engaged in with regularity to cultivate specific mental skills and what those are differ based on um what we're aiming to achieve and what the particular practices are. So just giving you three examples here, transcendental meditation, compassion practices, mindfulness meditation. And what distinguishes mindfulness from other forms of meditation is the intention is to cultivate this present centered or present moment attention with this non-judgmental, non-elaborative quality. And so all the practices, including the focused attention practices you've been doing and now the open monitoring that you've been engaging in more recently are um, built as a package deal to try to promote this understanding. Okay, it's just to say, that's what I mean when I use the term uh, meditation, maybe as even a slight digression from broader conversation. All right, so then, you know, going back to the NIH and their probing, they ask people, well, okay, of these things that you do in particular with meditation itself, why do you practice this? What is it achieving? Is you're doing it for psychological, well-being, but what is the challenge point that's doing it? And the, the common response was this. Uh, everybody really consistently said stress is what was driving their interest in doing it. I'm going to remove this slide because it always stresses me out. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about stress, attention, and performance. And let me just ask, has, has anybody seen this Yerky Dotson law before? Is this something that you've ever encountered before? Just not if, it, if it's a no. No, okay. So let's, I wanna to talk to you about this because I think that, that you know, I will say probably you guys fall into this category uh, and definitely some of the special operators and Marines fall into this category. When I start saying that stress is a problem, uh, often people will say, no, stress activates me. Stress actually motivates me to rise to the challenge, to be my best. It actually gives me the impetus to do well. Um, and yet here I am saying, look, stress over long periods of time is not good for you and your attention will degrade because of it, which we experience some of the well-being challenges with too much stress, but we might not connect it with our attentional capacity. So what this is saying, this yerkes dotson law is saying is that when stress is low, so for example, you know, I want you to prepare a, a paper for class, but it's not due till like six months from now, for example, let's say, stress is low and your performance on that paper is going to be pretty low. You're not going to even try to engage in it. Um, there's not a lot of motivation and, and uh, performance is not going to be all that, all that um, emphasized. But as we up the ante, right, as we start um, wanting to have people, I mean, sorry, as, as the circumstances are increase in stress, performance actually gets more and more robust. You get better and better at doing something as, you know, if I say you've got two days to prepare something, you might be ramped up, ready to go. That's enough time for you to do a good job, to focus, um, and there will be some optimal amount of stress in which your performance is peak. So you, there's a sweet spot of the level of demand, the, the level of stress, and your performance. Would you all say that that resonates with your experience? That sometimes it does feel like stress can kind of motivate good performance. Yes? Okay. So I'm not going to disagree with you on that, just like I didn't disagree with the special operators and Marines that said that it activates them. Um, but unfortunately, if you keep going with that level of demand and you push past that sweet spot, now all of a sudden you're in the distress zone and performance will be degraded. That may also seem sort of obvious. Like, yeah, I know that there's too much stress, like too much demand on me, maybe not just with the workload, but all the factors in my life that add to my stress levels. And I can see, yeah, my performance is going to be compromised. But here's the key point that I wanted to mention. If you have this optimal amount of stress, 
and you do perform well under it. For a short, pro you know, not protracted, a very punctate period of time, it will help you. But even if it's that same level of stress, so nothing really changed, there's still a certain amount of demand, but you experience it over a longer period of time, now all of a sudden you're gonna start entering into the distress zone. And I think that's also important to say that even if it feels like, you know, I, I've done this before, what's the problem? Well, you may have done it before, but everything that came before and everything that comes after may be actually pushing you into distress. So this is just to say there is this lawful relationship between how much demand there is on you, how much experienced of perceived overwhelm, which is what I call, which is what perceived stress is, and your performance. Is that, does that make sense to y'all? Okay. So, you know, I think that I'm gonna just kind of jump right into, since our time is so short, some of the studies we've done in military service members. But I did wanna give you a sense that, you know, this is a very poignant example. This is a photo project that was done with pre-deployment soldiers. Um, just pictures taken of their faces before they were deployed, during deployment, and after deployment. And we don't need to say much, but I'll, I mean, I'll just read this, I think, beautiful St. Jerome quote that captures it. The face is the mirror of the mind. The eyes without speaking confess the secrets of the heart. And you can just see it on their faces that over periods of high demand, there are costs. And those costs show up, not so much in a poetic artistic sense, but in an actual brass tacks. Uh, I keep using that term and I realize you guys are all law students, so I shouldn't use that. <laughs> um, but in the context of just research, um, if we actually probe people, so we have our participants come in at the beginning of what we know will be a st high stress interval. That can be deployment in the context of service members, students in the context of an academic semester. If we were working with lawyers that were on some kind of uh, long-term preparatory interval for a case or actually in the middle of, of pursuing a long trial, um, the high stress interval can be a week, two weeks. It could be whatever interval that you'd like over which there's incessant demand that's unending and performance needs to be maintained. So we say, okay, we see the starting point of this. We ask them to report their well-being. After two, four, six, eight weeks later, months later, we ask them again. And what we see is what you saw in those images of the soldiers' faces, that well-being will decline. And maybe that's no surprise, right? We experience that. And I just wanna contrast that with what would happen, which is this dotted line of um, having no real chronic high demand interval that you're experiencing. So we might have little ups and downs around that, but we're not gonna just overall start sliding down the slope. Um, but that is what we see with um, high stress intervals. And I wanna relate that now um, to attention because this is our experience, our well being. but we might not think of, of uh, what happens to our attention as this core capacity we need to be able to actually manage the task demands of the high stress interval. Um, but you'll see how it, how, how it relates. So let's just take a moment and, and talk about um, attention. And Scott, tell me how much time I have left. Uh, we're gonna <laughs> go till 10, 15, 11, 15. So allocate it however you'd like. Okay, great. So I think what I'm gonna do is actually just talk to you about um, attention. And I think I'm just gonna actually stop the share so I can see your faces. And then what I'm gonna do after I talk to you a little bit about attention in probably the last, uh, three or four minutes is I wanna to describe to you the research that we've been doing with regard uh, to attention. But what I wanna do is actually describe three brain systems of attention that, that um, really parcel out what this system is. Now, when I say the word attention, if I kinda of asked you, you know, just, what does that mean to you? Some of you might say, well, maybe it has to do with focus or being able to concentrate, et cetera. Um, but attention actually has multiple interacting capacities. And one metaphor that we use often with regard to attention is the flashlight metaphor. So wherever it is that you are directing that mental flashlight, uh, you'll get privileged access to information. So if you're on a darkened path and you're walking and, and you direct your, path, uh, your flashlight to the path, you'll be able to see clearly what's going on and it'll help you so you don't fall you know, on any rocks or pebbles, but you pretty much won't have access to anything else around you, right? It's privileged access to just the path. And the same thing goes with the mind's capacity to pay attention. It's just like the flashlight. Wherever it is that you direct that flashlight in the external environment, so right now if you're directing it toward your screen, you're gonna get more information about you know, me and my, what I look like and my, um, the words coming out of my mouth. 
relative to if you're trying to listen to something in another room or you're actually on your phone or whatever it is, right? You, you get that. But I want to also remind you that that flashlight is not just directed to the external environment. We can willfully direct that flashlight to the internal environment. And we do this very often. You might do it in the context of a mindfulness practice where you're checking in with the body, for example, but you also do it with regard to content knowledge you have and autobiographical personal memories you have. So if I ask you, um, you know, it's 11 now, um, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Can everybody do that? You might be saying, oh, I, I forgot to have breakfast. I've been sitting in front of this computer for hours on, on end, whatever it is. But the point is just that you, what happened in that moment is that you probed your long-term memory. Actually, it is long-term memory. You allowed that information to arise and then you were shining the flashlight on that to actually recall it back to yourself, okay? So you could do that for just content knowledge. You could do that from, for emotions. So what's the last time you experienced joy? You know, you could do the same thing. Ah, joy, and you experience that in the moment because the flashlight is shining on that. So that's what we call the orienting system of attention. And that is a very powerful brain system um, that we obviously use all the time. And I wanted to just mention that it's also the brain system that we think becomes problematic in uh, psychological illnesses like depression. So with depression, what we think happens is that flashlight just keeps pointing to depressogenic thoughts. Uh, we even call it attentional rubbernecking, you know, kind of like you just kind of, kind of like when you're driving down the road and they might see something you need to, like an accident or something like that, this kind of uh, desire to go look back Flashing the, uh, sorry, pointing the flashlight on depressogenic thought is prominent in people that suffer from depression. We don't usually think about depression as a disorder of attention, but actually, in fact, it is because it's not allowing us to have control over where we're directing our focus, all right? So that's one aspect of attention, the flashlight or the orienting system. Another aspect of attention is, is something that I like to use the metaphor of a a flashing yellow um, light or like a caution light. When you're driving down the road, I'm not talking about a yellow traffic light. I'm talking about you're just driving down the road and you see a flashing yellow light. What does that typically mean? Usually it means just be alert, right? Pay attention. You might not know what's, what the deal is. It might be a weird traffic pattern or maybe there's children around or whatever it is, but you are asked to be in this surveilling mode of watchfulness, very different than the flashlight right? Instead of broad, narrow, and privileging, you're not privileging anything. I would say this system is very much aligned to what we've been talking about, what you guys have been talking about with regard to open monitoring. So it's, it's, it's still an intentional system, but nothing is really uh, going to be thrown out as irrelevant, and nothing is going to be necessarily held as particularly relevant till it captures your attention. And for example, if you're driving, you got to take action, right? So there's orienting, as we talked about the flashlight, alert, uh, alerting, which is this flashing yellow traffic light. And that system actually ends up being quite problematic in disorders like anxiety and PTSD. And what ends up happening with uh, the, um, the alerting system is that everything sort of feels in one's life like that yellow flashing light, traffic light. It's like you're on this hyper vigilant, hyper alert uh, perspective. So again, just to, to make clear that what we might have thought of as this psychological disorders aspect that has to do with our, our emotional state actually is tied to the way that our attention system functions, okay? And then the third type of attention is, uh, I like to use the metaphor of a juggler. And this is something called the executive system of attention. We use that term executive because it's very much like the executive of a company. Uh, the job of the executive is not to do every single task, right, but to oversee what's going on. And just like that juggler, you have to make sure all the balls are happening, they're in the air and none of the balls are dropped. To make sure that your, um, your goals and your performance are aligned. And often in disorders like ADHD, for example, the juggler is kind of not working all that well and balls get dropped. The goals and the behavior don't always align. So, the reason I'm mentioning all three of these systems is because in the work we're doing with attention um, and mindfulness training, what we find is that under high stress circumstances, all three of these systems become compromised. You, you're more prone to having that flashlight point in the wrong direction or not even know where it's pointing, kind of you land somewhere and you don't know. You end up hyper vigilant sometimes where you kind of excessively watchful about what might be happening and anxiety may emerge. And I think probably more critically, 
this impacts your ability to ensure that your performance and your goals are aligned. Okay, so what I want to do is just share with you um, the research we've been doing where we've taken individuals over high stress circumstances, and these are military service members. And what we have had to do is actually take mindfulness training programs at, that are mostly quite long, you know, eight weeks, 24 to 40 hours where you're practicing 45 minutes a day. We're asking you to practice 45 minutes a day, which have shown wonderful results in the civilian medical context. We know that people, you know, their, their bodies are functioning better. They have more resilience to physical disorders, for example. They have better uh, physical health. Uh, things like rheumatoid arthritis or high blood pressure are benefited from mindfulness training with these longer form programs. Um, we know that, that the mind is benefited from these longer form programs. So for example, anxiety, depression, PTSD, ADHD benefit from these eight week programs that are offered in over 700 medical settings around the world. And then finally, we know that relationships are also known to be better with mindfulness training of this sort. So in some sense, we know from the civilian literature that, um, and I'm saying civilian because I'm kind of contrast that with the military work that we've done, um, we know from the, this literature that attention with all three of these systems is strengthened. And we know that there are improvements in, in the body's physical health, the psychological health of the mind, and our relationships. All right. But unfortunately, because this um, training program is so long, it's almost a non-starter to offer people in these high stress circumstances. Cause like, I don't have any, I would say I myself, even though I study this and I know the benefits, I don't have 40 hours to give right now or 45 minutes a day to give. And Scott and I, in our, in our conversations and all of his, you know, wonderful work over these decades on contextualizing training and optimizing delivery. So it's really most efficient and effective and, and minimizes time demands. Um, he and I have pursued this, uh, training program where we've been able to condense the training down into about eight hours over four weeks where we offer people and ask people to do about 15 minutes of practice a day. And so far what we're finding is that the minimum effective dose, so to speak, is people that are practicing, I would say, you know, I call it the sort of daily dozen, 12 to 15 minutes a day. And if you do that for at least three times a week, you're going to start being able to protect your attention and all of these corresponding and related functions. Okay, so that to say that there, once you know the basics of how to practice, uh, the suite of practices, focused attention, open monitoring, for example, and then you commit to some period of time as you're able to, trying to achieve around 12 to 15 minutes a day, you will see benefits, all right? So let me just share um, just some of the um, more recent studies that we've done in the last kind of five minutes. Now, it won't even take me five minutes because it's just a couple slides that I want to share with you. So this is a project where we offered uh, uh, this program called Mindfulness-Based Attention Training, MBAP, this eight-hour, four-week program where we asked people to practice 15 minutes a day. We offered it to firefighters, Miami-Dade firefighters, but we were actually asking them to practice not during hurricane season, but actually before hurricane season. So we didn't expect that their attention would actually degrade over the four week interval of the training because they weren't in an excessively high demand interval. And we just asked them what their resilience was like. You know, how are you feeling with regard to your own uh, capacity to be resilient? And I'm just showing you here uh, the results from um, that study. So what you should see, do you see the slide now again? Just nod, okay. So we had one group that got nothing and they remained pretty stable in their resilience. We, got, we had a group that got relaxation training. So another powerful tool that can be used um, to actually feel better uh, in, in certain high demand circumstances, though these per people weren't in a particularly high demand circumstance, no change in the relaxation group over four weeks. They ma maintained, their, they were stable over time. But the mindfulness training group significantly improved. The people that got this MBAT program reported feeling more resilient, suggesting to us that we were able to train resilience. And what was very interesting about this is that this capacity to be resilient corresponded with their core ability to pay attention. And the way that we track attention in my lab, um, just to remind you of, you know, that these are objective measures. Now, when we go to from resilience, which is subjective, and you say how resilient you feel, to attention, you can use performance-based metrics, brain-based metrics to see how well people perform in their tasks of attention. So, you sit in front of a computer screen, you do a series of attentionally demanding tasks, 
We look at your accuracy and your response times. This is not something that you can just kind of willfully change your performance on. And over high stress now, um, people, by the way, the firefighters didn't show this. The firefighters looked stable over time. We still were able to see some improvement in their attention. But if we look at people over high stress intervals, their attention actually systematically and reliably declines, just like well being declines. So when we move from people um, training individuals or high performance, high stress groups under kind of normal conditions to now under high stress conditions. Um, so, you know, if we had actually followed through with the firefighters and now tra trained them and offered them uh, this research during hurricane season, we would have seen this for the group that got no training. They would have gotten worse. This is the pattern we see over and over again in pre deployment military cohorts, for example. We also see the same pattern in students over the academic semester. So the question is, what happens if you give these same individuals um, that if we did nothing at all would look like this over high stress, a mindfulness training program over that high stress interval? And remember, we're willing to do this because we've really tried to make it the most time efficient program possible. And so the research I'm going to kind of summarize here in the last slide or two is just we've worked with a whole host of people from the different military branches, right? We worked with the Marine Corps, Special Operations, etc. And for all of these different groups, we've offered this four week training program with this requirement or request for 15 minutes a day um, under high stress circumstances. And what I'm showing you now is what most of them showed. So when we compare it, the, when we look at the no training group, they significantly declined in their performance, just as we'd predicted. But what was fascinating, and, and we've seen now over and over again in our published studies, is when they got MBAT, this mindfulness training program, they actually stayed stable over time. Now, most research studies, researchers will not jump up and down to say, hey, look, I did something and nothing changed. But it's important to us to say that this is actually quite powerful because we know that if we do nothing at all, things will change and they'll change in the wrong direction. People are going to get worse. So I wanted to just end on this note to say um, that this, this type of training is beneficial, not just broadly speaking in terms of stress reduction, wellness improvement, improvements for mind, body, and relationships, but really this core brain system of attention that we need for literally every single thing we do. And the kind of hopeful part was that for those individuals that already have strong attention, uh, in this case for, our, for us it was special operators, they didn't actually decline over the no training interval and they actually got better even though it was a high stress interval because they had committed with um, you know, real consistency to practicing 15 minutes a day for at least three times a week. All right, so I'm gonna stop this share and just end now. Oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't really give any time for questions, but I hope that this gave you kind of a broad sense of the approach that we take in the kind of research that we do in my lab, as well as the value and utility of knowing what, it, what attention is, how it works, and, and how vulnerable it can be over these circumstances. I mean, in some sense, yes, it's, if you experience it, it's in your head, but it's literally in your head. It is the way that your brain is functioning in these moments. Um, and that there's a hopefulness, even as we right now are experiencing high stress, um, you should be confident, at least based on the research that we've done over the last decade, to say that even if I've never really given it a full try, if I start even now, while the demands are high, I can benefit. And it's not an inordinate amount of time, as little as 15 minutes a day in these focused attention and open monitoring practices that you can be expertly guided with Scott himself um, can benefit your capacity to pay attention, uh, which unfortunately we're all vulnerable to at this at this time. All right, so I'll just end there. Um, well, and, yeah. well, and thank you, and 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 just because it's such a treat to have you and to hear um, all that you've shared. If we let's take maybe a few minutes, um, should you have a question over any of the things that Dr. Jalamishi has spoken to? Um, or that you um, just think about in general um, before we then uh, sh transition on. If you have a few minutes, Amishi, do you? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. go ahead. You know, part, that's, first of all, I'll just say under active investigation, right? Because yeah, the first thing is that the whole category of physical ailments that have been well studied are those tied uh, to uh, uh, those known to have a relationship to uh, people's stress levels and that have are in this category of, of being sort of related to autoimmune functions, which are again tied to stress. 
So the mechanisms of action of how mindfulness training is actually benefiting those kind of ailments is still done through the same route. So if paying attention to our present moment experience can cut the cycle of rumination and worry, which adds to our incessant experience of stress, it may reduce stress-related hormones sort of circulating in our baseline blood serum, which then have this whole host positive cascade in the body to start allowing the body to heal itself. Um, because unfortunately, the onslaught of, uh, and presence of high cortico, cort you know, cortisol in the bloodstream uh, starts disabling um, the body's own rep repair systems. Um, which can add to inflammation, which actually is what leads to a whole host of illnesses, including rheumatoid arthritis. So I just want to say that, yes, that we're working out the details on the, on the exact mechanisms, but what seems to be key is that people, when they practice these suite of practices, if they're able to actually experience less perceived stress, which comes through better control of their attention, right? The flashlight isn't going to depressogenic thoughts. The, flash, uh, the, the yellow flashing light isn't just experiencing anxiety then you benefit from this cascade. I mean, it's, it, it's a great question. I, I'm very glad that you've got Scott to lean on for more direct guidance for practices, but just from the kind of mechanistic approach, right? So this is a battle for your attention in some sense. There's the task at hand, which mm -hmm. you, you're deciding with your voluntary attention system to point the flashlight on the task at hand. That's what you wanna do. And all of a sudden you're finding that it's getting yanked over here or yanked over there. And then it's causing this sort of broader vigilance or hypervigilance that can be problematic. Mm -hmm. So I think you're already on track with one aspect, which is that you're noticing all of this. You're aware of the kind of stew or milieu that you're, you're in right now. Um, and then the other thing is that you're actually leaning on practice already. So mm -hmm. you know that when things feel like I'm not able to actually get a handle on what's going on, maybe if I actually take a few moments and practice, I can kind of recapture some of those uh, aspects of my own capacities to, to continue. If you can actually go an hour right now before you're incessantly looking at your phone, that's actually a success. So to remember that too, is that mm -hmm. these are trying times. Um, but here's a couple things that I would suggest you, you think about. Um, do it in bite-sized chunks. So if it seems like about an hour or 45 minutes is your upper limit of how long you're able to pay attention before that kind of tug starts re-emerging, make that the dedicated period of time. You know, just like you would for mindfulness practice, say, okay, 15 minutes, timer's on, that's what I'm doing. You can treat your work time as your mindfulness practice. So I'm going to decide to dedicate my focus, my flashlight to the task at hand and make it appropriate for what is seems within the reasonable range. None of, none of us need to be doing anything that tortures us beyond what feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, after that period of time is done and you now are free to do whatever you want and the urge to pick up the phone and look comes up or turn on your browser to start reading the news, I want you to just remember that noticing component. And part of that noticing is also noticing not only our state as we enter this interface, usually we're doing it so fast, but we're already on our phone. We're already on the mm -hmm. 10 bad news things that have happened since the last 45 minutes, right? So I just say, again, a time to practice your engagement with technology mindfully. Notice your, yourself picking up the phone, noticing what apps you're gonna go to, notice yourself kind of reviewing it. And here's the important piece. Before you even start engaging, just keep one question in mind that is really back to the juggler, the central executive. What is my goal? What do I want to achieve from my time interfacing with my phone in this moment? And hold that in your, in your ongoing attentional state or working memories, we call it. Because then what you might find is after, if the goal is, I wanna be informed about what's happening right now. If that is prominent in your mind, as you're going through and you're noticing, okay, this, this has changed, now we're on lockdown orders here, or this has changed in this neighborhood. Okay, I've achieved my understanding. My goal has check, right? Mm -hmm. And then think through other, other things that I wanna experience in my time before I go back to my next 45 minute work practice. Maybe I want a little leisure and connection. Okay, let's make sure that that is what you're achieving. Not being so, um, uh, at the whims of whatever appears on your feed, but you're more in control and holding that as the intention for the way you're going to practice. In the same way that if you're doing a breath awareness practice, you know the mind will wander, but the intention is to be aware of what's happening and then to return it back as you need to. First, let's 
take a note of what is what a the sound of two hands clapping uh, on the over Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And uh, because we do this, so be mindful that if a tree were to fall, it would, it would sound the same way, probably, um, <laughs> even though we're all watching it. So thank you, Amishi, very, very much for taking the time um, and for answering those questions. And thank you all for, for not only being present and attentive and engaged, as you all always are, but for also those two very, very superb questions.